Incidentally, I don't do sermons anymore. I, I, uh, 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 David Wright had mentioned that it was a pondering, and I'm more comfortable doing pondering. So you're getting my pondering response to a question that Roger put to me one day when we were having lunch. Why should anybody care about the Jesus tradition? He has been a, a, a reader of my blog for a number of years off and on. Sometimes he even posts. The blog is entitled uh, Wry Thoughts About Religion. He's also read a number of my professional publications on early Christianity and the Jesus tradition, is well aware of my views, professional, about the Jesus tradition, which I here summarize very, very briefly in part. One, the narrative realism, that is the realism of the text, of early Christian gospel literature is not a historical uh, realism, but it's a kind of romantic realism. I even published that. Two, the gospels are ultimately not historical narratives, but they are conf confessional narratives. They are more akin to religious propaganda than historical literature. Three, the Gospels are ultimately based on the memories of anonymous persons uh, whose oral reports, having come to the evangelists, are largely shaped to conform to the faith of the evangelists. And four, Jesus was a Judean artisan who was advanced to divinity by the belief of the early church, and then the later church made him part of a triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, in other words. These points are critical judgments about the historical reliability of the earliest literary sources founding, uh, presenting the founding events of the early Christian faith, but they don't address the, uh, the issue of the value of the tradition as a whole. Dr. Ray suggested that I have an obligation to explain to people of faith why I still concern myself with the Jesus traditions in light of my published views uh, about the tradition, essentially that the Jesus tradition is historically unreliable. I'm talking about the texts, that is the gospel texts, uh, and, the tra and traditional Christianity is ultimately based on mythology. Uh, of course, he's thinking about a progressive pastor, a preacher, and a prophet. I call him a prophet of social justice, I, and, I, and I've said that to him. Uh, while I, on the other hand, am a simple retired academic and a historian of Christian origins, our perspectives are quite different. Critiquing the Jesus tradition is something I do professionally. While he's a practitioner, I like to think, a practitioner of a new form of faith based on social justice. I didn't begin studying the Jesus traditions critically. In a Mississippi Delta Southern Baptist church, I was taught the Jesus tradition from a confessional standpoint. My critical views developed over the years uh, with critical studies of the Bible and Christianity through two graduate degrees in, um, in secular institutions. Knowing my critical views on the unreliability of the Gospels, uh, Dr. Ray put this question to me, from your perspective, why should anyone care about the Jesus tradition? It seems, he, um, he thought, said to me, you no longer, no longer hold to a mythical view of Jesus of Nazareth. That is to say, you no longer regard Jesus as the heaven-sent Son of God who died on the cross for your sins and the sins of others. You have also written that the resurrection is a myth, as also is Jesus' ascension into heaven and his being seated at the right hand of God. You're not expecting Jesus to come, said he, at some point in the future to judge the living and the dead. Your view seems to be that s such theological ideas or statements are bankrupt uh, for the modern world because they contradict everything we know about the nature of the universe. 
He is correct about the transformation of my ideas. The belief that Jesus was raised from the dead is based on an exception from the way things normally work in the world. We know the rule. When you die, you're dead, and you don't come back to life, okay? In the 21st century, that is. Uh, early on, they didn't know that rule, I guess. Um, in this one case, the death of Jesus, Christianity claims that God made an exception and brought Jesus back to life, a claim, incidentally, that was also made about the Neo-Pythagorean philosopher Apollonius. Christians are also called on to believe other exceptions. For example, here too, the ex uh, you know, you've all heard about the law of gravity, what goes up, or if you jump off, you're going to go down, so on. But the, that physical law is represented or portrayed as having been broken uh, in the Gospels with Jesus defying gravity and walking on the sur surface of the water. The gospel also, Gospels also portray him as feeding 9,000 people with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And when he finished, he had more left over than what he started with. These are exceptions to what we know the way things work in the common world. What Dr. Ray has asked of me is nothing less describing what the Jesus tradition contributes to modern life and to people of faith. What should, be, uh, what, what should you believe and what should be consigned to the bulging trash heaps of dead religions? Fortunately, he asked me to address the entire spectrum of the Jesus tradition, uh, to describe what, uh, what actually originated with Jesus as a, uh, and including those things that others found in the, of value in the Jesus tradition. So everything is given equal weight. One point of clarification, however, is necessary. There's not just one tradition. There are several traditions about Jesus. For example, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. They all purport to be talking about one man, a Judean man, Jesus, and they all come up with different interpretations of the man, and those uh, interpretations are contradictory. There are also 34 other Christian Gospels that we know of dating in the first two centuries after the time that Jesus lived. And there are at least 13 other Gospels in that period of which we only know the names. So there's not one single unified Jesus tradition. And it's spread out from actually um, being within the confines of Christianity, influencing other religions as well. The truth is, the man we call Jesus of Nazareth, the Judean artisan, is a historical X, an unknown quantity. His personal history basically is largely unknown. We know what people thought about him, but not really what, I mean, you have to dig th through the Gospels to sort out uh, things that might have originated with him from things that were attributed later to him. The sayings that uh, survive a critical historical sifting of the tradition reveals a man with radical ideas uh, that all varieties of the tradition work to domesticate. In other words, to bring him under control. The saying, love your enemies, is one such. The Jesus tradition as a whole contains what he said and did, and you got to work to sort that out, and what others thought about him. And in my consideration, all of that is given consideration. Here then are two reasons for my continuing interest in the Jesus tradition, um, and why I think aspects of the tradition deserve attention, and or will continue to be relevant to human life going into the future, no matter what happens to Christianity as a whole. 
First, judging from the pervasive influence of Christianity today, the iconic status of the Bible and the iconic status of the Bible in a contemporary American society, it seems obvious to me that the Jesus tradition currently is found to be relevant. I mean, the traditional views about Jesus as presented in the Gospels and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. In studying the Jesus tradition, critically, will remain a legitimate, if I can put it that way, public service for the foreseeable future. There will be a need for people to separate uh, things that Jesus himself probably said from things that are attributed to him by others in order to call into question illegitimate uses of the Jesus tradition. Hence, I con continue to be interested. If nothing else, I can keep the debates alive. <laughs> That's the idea. Here's my second reason. Setting aside the principal mythical aspects of Christianity, there is much in the Jesus tradition to recommend it for co continued study. For example, the early Christian writers have preserved certain ethical concepts inspiring much that is beneficial to Western civilization. Arguably, these ethical concepts would not have been realized <clears throat> excuse me, in British and American culture apart from the Jesus tradition. Here is one ethical concept, and this is all I'm going to give you. I'll say a few words about that. Love. In the G Jesus tradition, one, ki one finds a kind of liberal humanitarianism grounded in the concept of altruistic and unconditional love that has become embedded in the ethics of Western civilization. Altruistic love is an unselfish love for and devotion to the welfare of others uh, without either personal cost or personal benefit. And it's precisely the Jesus tradition that has imported this concept into Western civilization. Jesus brought over from the Israelite tradition, I don't call it the Jewish tradition because these are Israelite traditions in Hebrew Bible. Judaism is a later consumer of that tradition, and it's their history, I understand that, but it's an Israelite tradition. In the Israelite tradition, the neighbor was one's fellow Israelite rather than a fellow human being of whatever ethnic background. In other words, the neighbor was one of your own tribe. Love was also, to be sure, extended, extended to those sojourning among the Israelites, that is to say the stranger in their midst, a custom grounded in the hospitality codes of the ancient Near East. In the Hebrew Bible, love for the neighbor is a religious command. It's an obligation of the uh, Israelite community endorsed and, um, and directed by God. Um, which Jesus brought over into the Christian communities. It was a religious tradition. Uh, for example, here's what Paul said. Owe to no one anything, owe, owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. He means all of it, okay? All the commandments are summed up in this one sentence, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love fulfills the law. Now Paul is writing to be sure to a gathering of Jesus followers at Rome when he wrote that, it was from Romans. Hence in his statement, neighbor is not a fellow human being of whatever ethnic background. Uh, it is a religious community ethic. Love, for, love your fellow Christian is what Paul is saying. That is to say, one of your own tribe. Nevertheless, James 2, 1 through 13 seems to shade over into a universal humanitarian code of care and concern for fellow human beings of whatever background, 
when he, uh, he describes love as the royal law, James does. Gives the example of a rich man and a poor man coming into uh, a congregation. And uh, the rich man in his fine clothing is greeted and they're greeted and say, have a seat in a place of prominence. And the poor man, on the other hand, in his shabby clothing is said, uh, is told to stand over there or sit here at my feet. Such a uh, response to the poor man is dishonoring to him. If you were guided by the concept of love for the neighbor, however, one would be impartial and show, show hospitality to both men. James, however, does not portray tr uh, treatment uh, given to a community member but apparently care and concern for any old guy that wanders into the congregation. It's not necessarily at bottom a religious ethic. It seems to be grounded in a sense of humanitarianism. One of the clearest expressions of, uh, of this kind of secular altruistic love uh, is found in 1 Corinthians 13. Love in this passage does not appear to be a Christian attribute. I'll tell you why in just a minute. It, it appears to be a naked human quality. It's a human, as a human being that you do that. Uh, here's a summary of the chapter. Love is of more value than religious acts and knowledge and other forms of charity. It is a love that characteristically puts others before self. This is a kind of love that epitomizes what it means to be a mature human being. Hence, love, it turns out, has greater value than even religious faith or hope. Here's a quote from the chapter that clearly illustrates this character of altruistic love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not, irrit it is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. There's no mention in this chapter of theology or, God, uh, or theology or Christology. God and Jesus are not mentioned as those values that uh, lead one to act in this way. These observations constitute only some of the reasons that some scholars think Paul didn't write that chapter. It's not a Pauline section. Seriously uh, challenge it. Uh, he didn't compose it. He used it in 1 Corinthians 13. But it's likely Greco-Roman in origin. And here is one saying that unquestionably illustrates the uh, altruist, altruistic, uh, unconditional love that, that David spoke before he sat down. Love your enemies. Simple, bare, unequivocal. The context in which that saying is uh, caught, however, struggles against the concept of lo loving enemies by offering one lesser actions that one can do than actually loving enemies. Uh, Luke and Matthew suggest that loving, enemy, uh, loving enemies means doing favors for those who help you, uh, hate you blessing those who curse you, praying for, the, praying for your abusers. All of these behaviors that they mention involve less risk, and you can easily do them without ever loving anybody, it seems to me. But loving, loving like you love your wife, your children, your parents, dear friends, it's a very dangerous thing to do. And so it's no wonder that we find these limitations suggested in Matthew and Luke. What does one do when the welfare of friends and enemies clash? How is it possible to love both with the same degree of intensity and trust? 
in the final analysis, the idea that one should love one's enemies is irrational and absurd, however inspirational it may be. For in loving the one, an individual will inevitably break faith with the other, or to state the matter boldly, loving your enemy can get your neighbor killed. What follows from here uh, is a list of sayings taken from here and there in the Jesus tradition that really began as uh, a community ethic, you know, something just for the community. But uh, you can still hear within them the humanitarian concern. Listen, give to everyone who begs from you. And do not refuse him who would borrow from you. Give to everyone who begs from you and whoever takes away your goods, don't ask them back again. If you have money, don't put it out at interest, but give it to someone from whom you won't get it back. If you love those who hate you, <laughs> what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who hate them, who love them. From anyone who takes away your outer garment, do not withhold even your undergarment. Those who go hungry till their bellies are grumbling to fill the starving belly of another are blessed. Hard concepts all. Briefly in conclusion, altruistic concern for the human other is not necessarily a religious ethic. Its highest form is expressed in humanitarian actions for others of whatever ethnic background. And in my view, our human society would be seriously deficient without the concept. Altruistic love may, may actually be the quintessential, the quintessential quality that defines what it means to be human. Why study the Jesus tradition? Why be concerned with it? It reminds us of what's best about our humanity. Thank you. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.